Okay, so what we're going to look at now are assemblies in GSA, um, just to describe what they are and how we use them, what they're useful for. So we start off just thinking about the different scales that we have when we're modeling. So we've got the large scale, which is the whole structure. But in order to get results from that, we need to create lots of small elements. And so we have that small scale as well. But very often, we're interested in results which exist at a level in between that. So we've got this intermediate level, which is not readily accessible from the normal uh, analysis results, but which we do want to be able to extract things from. And so the assembly is something which we've introduced to span between that large and small scales. So we've got the idea of an assembly. It would just give a couple of examples of where we might use it. If you've got a fairly regular um, orthogonal frame, for instance, a typical sort of office block, uh, you may well have a core which will be providing the lateral stability. Now, depending on how you choose to model it, you may want to model that core with lots of shell elements. By modeling it with shell elements, you'll be able to get the detail that you need, so you'll be able to have openings where you've got uh, lifts, that kind of thing. Uh, so you can get the level of detail that you need to model that um, in, a, in a way that's reliable and robust. The problem is that you may want to know how does this core deflect as a whole, what bending moments do we have along it. And so what we're doing there is we're moving from looking at something which is at the element level, uh, and we want to look at it uh, aggregated across many different elements. So by putting in an assembly that models the core, uh, we're then able to span those different scales that we have in the model. Another example might be where we've got a truss which is part of our structure. So we've got a truss that's spanning between columns. We could choose to model that truss just as a single beam element perhaps, but equally we might want to model it in more detail looking at the top and the bottom cords and the bracing elements within the truss. So that gives us the best level of detail in terms of what is happening in the truss, but again we might just want to know how it's deflecting under load, what bending moments there are in the truss as a whole. So again, we're looking at things not at the element level, but across lots of elements, and they're again going up a level in terms of the scale. So an assembly is a way of collecting together these elements, and essentially what we're doing is we're saying there are lots of things which we can think of as being, if you like, a super beam. So it's something which is like a beam element in many respects, but rather than being modeled as a single element, it's going to be modeled by a whole selection or a whole group of elements. So in order to define an assembly, we need to have information about which elements are included. We also need to know something about location and orientation. So when we're dealing with a single beam element, we've got a node at each end and we've got ways of seeing which way round we orient the Y and the Z axis. When we're dealing with an assembly, some of that information is a little more difficult to define, but we still need it. So in the end, we've got something which we can think of as being like a beam element, which has ends and which has an orientation. Now the other thing we then need to do is decide how we want to subdivide this for internal calculations. So if we're thinking of something like a core, we may have one assembly representing the whole core, but we want to know what's happening at different intervals along that. So we need some way of seeing how we want to subdivide that assembly uh, to get the, the internal points that we need. Okay, so at that point, um, I'm going to switch over to have a look at the GSA model. So what we've got here is just a very simple model, but it's got something which is a crude representation of a core and something which is a fairly simple representation of a truss in this, uh, in this model. So first of all, if we just look at the display, we've got the option of showing the different assemblies. So if I want to look at the core, we've got this set of elements which are representing the core. And that's our core and structure. And then the other assembly that we've got is one which represents the truss. So we've got this shallow truss, which is part of the, the whole model. 
So if we go in and look at how we define those, they're defined under the general data, and we've got these two assemblies. So the first one is core. Um, I've predefined the element lists, so I've got a list called underscore core and one called underscore trust. But we could simply uh, specify directly the elements that we want here. And we've got two different ways of defining them, either with topologies or with assemblies. Right, rather than going through in the table, what I'm going to do is go into the wizard where we can see more clearly how we have defined the elements that make up the core assembly. So the assembly definition is by node. And what we've done is we've defined a node <coughs> at each end of that, uh, that core that we want to define. So 170 and 171 are just two nodes which are floating in space, but they define the extents of this assembly. The orientation node, 174, is just another node which is used to define the y-axis direction of that assembly. In this case, we're only interested in having a straight assembly, so we don't have any internal topology, um, and we don't need to bother about the curve fit. But if we wanted to have something which is following some curve, we can define internal uh, nodes, and then choose how to fit a curve through those. So as well as handling something which is straight, we can have a curved one, provided we use the node definition. So that's the basic definition of the core assembly. Then on the right-hand side of this, we've got the way that we're defining the number of internal uh, points that we're using. So in this case, we're using the option of number of points, but there's different options for us. There we can instead choose the spacing if we want. Uh, if it's a suitable assembly, we can use the story option, or there's an explicit option where we actually define particular positions starting from the beginning of the assembly, moving along it. So in this case, we're just choosing to have 10 points, which will be spaced along the assembly. Let me just come out of that one. And if we go back and look here, you I'll switch to the assembly. So you can see down at the bottom here that we've got a floating node. So that is one of the nodes used to define it, and we've got the node at the top. So essentially what we're saying is that we've got an assembly which is running along the middle of the core. We go into the labeling options, and the geometric entities, I could choose to display the element x-axis and the element axis. And if we do that, you can see that it's drawing us um, the line down the center of this core. Uh, and showing us that the y direction of the axis is aligning from the uh, main x-axis definition towards that third node that we've defined. Okay, so that's our core assembly. The other one that we have is the truss assembly. So if we have a look at how that one is defined, because that's using the axis definition. So again, if we go into the wizard, so this time the definition is by axis, and I'm using the global axis. Now, the axis is only used to provide the orientation that's associated with the assembly. We also need to then have some way of saying where it starts and ends. And in this case, we're just using the simple option of from the elements, but we can specify that directly. So in the case of from elements, it looks at the element list that we've defined up here. And from the elements that are in that list, it sees where they start as we go along the x-axis direction of the axis that we've specified, and it ends once we reach the end of the elements, which are along that axis that we've specified. So in this case, it will be starting at the end of one end of the truss, going along to the other end. If we decided we actually don't want to include the end parts of the truss in this, we could then specify directly where we want it to start and where we want it to end. Now, the other problem that we have is that the global axis is associated with the global origin. Our trust is not there. And so what we want to do as well is specify an offset from that axis. So in this case, we've got a YZ offset of 0 and 3.75. And that means that we're taking that global axis and, in effect, we're shifting it up so that we now have the x-axis running along at the level of the trust that we want. We'll look at where the x-axis is placed in just a minute. Again, um, 
we need to decide how we're going to define the internal points. And in this case, I've chosen the spacing option, and we want one every 0.4 of a meter. Of the options we've got here, the story one wouldn't work for this one because it's story one is only uh, relevant if we've got an assembly which is vertical. So we could have used it for the core one, but we we need to have two conditions satisfied. One that the assembly is in the vertical direction and that we have stories defined. Okay, so looking at our truss, you can see that we've got our, our truss assembly here and we've got the x-axis of that one and we've got the x, y and z um, defined uh, based on the global axis. Okay, so we've now got our two assemblies. Uh, we didn't think at the stage, this stage whether we had results or not. And one of the nice things about assemblies is that they can be defined at any time. So they don't need to be defined before we've analyzed the model. We can add them afterwards if we want. Uh, we can change the assemblies, add new ones. And because of the way they work, we can actually have assemblies which are part of a larger assembly. So there's no reason for each assembly to be exclusive. Um, they all refer to a particular list of nodes and we can have lists which overlap. Okay, let's um, just go back to our core model. So we can then start to look at results on this. So um, if you go into the contouring, um, we go down to the bottom where we've got assemblies, then we have assembly results. So we could look at the uh, translations and, uh, and uh, contour those. Uh, we could choose other things like the bending moments in in the assembly, and we can see that it doesn't do very much in that one. We can look in the other direction to see what that does, and in fact, because this one is a dead load, it's not really going to be doing very much. But if we go and look at a different case, then we might see something more useful. And so anyway, we have a display of the results on the assembly so we can see what's happening to that assembly as a whole rather than seeing what's happening in the individual elements. As well as looking at contouring, so let's just clear the contours. We can also look at diagrams, so we again have the assembly results here, so displacements, drifts, forces and moments. And in the output, we can also get detailed results of forces and moments. So if I specify what I want, so let's say we just want to look at the dead load, for instance, then we can get results for the assembly at these positions along it. One thing that's worth noting is that these positions don't start at zero. They start just a little bit in from the ends. Um, that's a small distance in to try and minimize the error in that, uh, but that's related to the way in which the calculations are done, so we need to have that small offset. Okay, so if I now go back to the presentation, um, so in order to do the calculations, well, GSC has to look through the entities which we've defined in the assembly. So in terms of the displacement, it has to first of all look through the different internal points that have been specified. Then at each of those points as we move along the assembly, it does a cut through the, the elements that form that assembly and then identifies from those what the displacements are at the positions for each of the nodes that are related to that, or the positions between the nodes. And then the displacements of the cut plane are calculated by taking the average of those. So as we go along, if the some of the nodes are moving in one direction and some are moving in another direction, then that will tend to average out to give you an overall a zero deflection. So for instance, where you've got something which is bending, you may be getting nodes on one side of the core moving up and on the other side moving down, but overall the core is not doing very much at all. So this is just a way of averaging out those displacements. 
In a similar way, we can do the calculation of the rotations. The rotation calculation is a little bit more involved, but again, it's essentially trying to calculate what the average rotation is um, based on the displacements that we're getting in the different nodes. And the, the rotation calculations are all done about the location of the x-axis of the assembly. When it comes to getting the forces and the moments, again, we're having to loop through all the points as we go along the assembly. Um, for each of those points, we again cut through all the elements. We work out what the forces are on each of those cuts, and then we sum those up. So the total force that we get at any point I is the sum of all the forces in the elements which have been cut at that particular location. And the moment is the moment plus the force times the offset that's giving us the additional term. So again, the moment calculation is about the axis of the assembly, and so it's worth thinking a little bit about where you put that axis so that you get moments which are going to be useful and sensible for you. So, uh, just in summary, assemblies are there to give you access to information at that level between the structure as a whole and individual elements. This is all handled as something which is done post-processing. Uh, so whenever you ask for results for the assembly, it goes off and assembles the, the results it needs from the element results, which means that you don't need to define the assemblies before you do the analysis, and you can change them um, as and when you need to. And assemblies exist can exist at different scales, so you might be looking at a whole core, but you may have another assembly within that model which is just looking at the detail in a particular part of that core. So you may have a lintel uh, where you've got lift openings and you want to look at that as an assembly because that's modeled with 2D elements. You want to see what's happening locally in that area. So you, they can exist um, at several different levels within the structure as a whole. And you can use those both with analysis cases and with combination cases. And in particular, it's worth pointing out, they can be used for response spectrum analysis. That tends to be one which is more complicated because you need to go back every time to the model results. Uh, and so if you ask for assembly results for response spectrum analysis, it will go back to the modal ones, calculate the appropriate values for each mode, and then do the summing using, for instance, the CQC or whatever method you specified so that you get the results that you need for that. And that's all I wanted to say about assembly. 